You pull together any list of the most important figures in Canadian film, and that list is going to have the director, Norman Jewison. Norman is a legend by any definition of the term. Yesterday, Norman Jewison died at 97. Today on the podcast, how Norman changed Canadian cinema. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. I think it's fair to start with the big stuff. Norman Jewison has made movies that will last forever. And you didn't try to find out who? Believe me, I've done everything short of asking Agnes. Why haven't you asked her? She can't even remember the birth. Do you think she'd admit to the conception? <laughs> sort of an American type head on her. You could put it that way, yes. And uh, whose head are you after? Yours. Mine. Why should you want to know? Why are you obsessed with fighting times and fates you can't defy? In order there, you heard from Agnes of God, The Thomas Crown Affair, Jesus Christ Superstar. All those movies, all those movies are considered classics, and those aren't even the ones that got him Oscar nominations for Best Director. Those would be In the Heat of the Night from 1967, Fiddler on the Roof from 1971, and Moonstruck from 1987. Three Best Director nominations in three different decades. One of those movies, In the Heat of the Night, won Best Picture. I've also been noticing lately that Moonstruck is so beloved by the internet that maybe every month or so, a clip from that movie goes viral. But Set aside the movies, if you can, for just a second, and look at the legacy. Norman Jewison is the founder of the Canadian Film Center. This is a massive platform that has launched the careers of so many Canadian filmmakers. Today, we're going to take a moment to celebrate everything that Norman Jewison gave us. To do that, we have one of his longtime friends, Rick Mercer, filmmaker Clement Virgo, director of Brother, and the Globe and Mail's art and film editor, Barry Hertz. Barry, Clement, Rick, welcome to Commotion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, let me Forever. begin by saying I'm sorry for your loss to all of you. Rick, I'll start with you on this one. You went from becoming an admirer of Norman's films to becoming his friend. Tell us how he entered your life. What was he like? Well, uh, I'd like to start off by saying you, you opened by saying any list of influential filmmakers, Norman would be on it. Not yeah. only would he be on it, he would be number one, and there would be no debate by anyone in the film or television community about yeah. that. He would absolutely be number one on that list. Yeah. He, I was obviously an admirer, and I was a huge fan of the film, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming. And I had met Norman a few times, but in 1990, he called me up and he said, I was thinking maybe writing a reboot of The Russians Are Coming, and maybe you'd like to write it. Now, this is a call that you would never expect in a million years. It's like George Lucas is called and asking you to bang around some ideas for a Star Trek, Star Wars franchise. It's a, it, it was like no call I had ever received. I ended up working on a film script with Ed Rich, the writer, and we would go to Norman's office in Toronto, which was a, like a 1970s era man cave <laughs> filled with incredible memories and scripts and photos and everything else. And we would read this script that we created and Norman would read all the parts out loud. And it was an incredible learning experience and uh, a, a friendship was the result. And, um, it's uh, something that I'm, I'll be eternally grateful for. What was it like to be around him? Uh, would you describe hanging out with Norman? What was that like? Well, when we were working on the script, it was all work. It mm. was, there was no dilly dallying at all. If there's three or four hours in the morning, three or four hours in the afternoon, just work, work, work. He didn't want you looking at your phone. He didn't want to discuss anything else other than the script. And he would love to read the parts and act out the parts. But then, <laughs> When lunchtime came, we would go for these long lunches and then sometimes dinner. And then he was more than happy to answer questions about his incredible career, which for anyone who loves movies, loves show business, yeah. loves actors, that was just an incredible opportunity. You can't even imagine. Uh, Clement, you also got to know Norman personally. What did he mean to you? Um, Norman, uh, was, a was my first mentor, you know, I met, uh, I met Norman in 1991, um, at mm -hmm. the CFC, um, that summer, the CFC had a program for filmmakers of color. And I was fortunate enough to be one of those young filmmakers that was invited to, um, participate. And there I met Norman Joyson. Um, and, you know, subsequently I made my first feature film out of, uh, at the CFC and Norman was, uh, 
generous enough. Um, I was having troubles, you know, trying to figure out the cut of my film. And Norman was generous enough to come into my editing room and mm. sat with me and, and you know, said, look, you don't need this scene. And um, he was such a great storyteller. Um, so so when I did finish edit that, my first film, Rude, that film subsequently ended up going to Cannes. And so I, I thank Norman for really helping me um mm. you know getting that film out there and you know just you just played a, a you know a bunch of Norman's films and there's no one that spans genres like Norman you know you, you play the musical you know uh you know Jesus Christ Superstar Fiddler on the Roof you know he did sort of heist slick heist films like yeah. uh, you know uh, Thomas Fran Affair he did serious dramas like In the Heat of the Night you know and, and for my money you know he's made three of the best black films ever you know with In the Heat of the Night The Soldier's Story in the hurricane, hmm. you know, and this was a, you know, a liberal, um, in the best sense of the word guy from, from the beaches in, 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 the, in Toronto. Um, and he was a progressive and, um, and a, a real uh, mentor. And, you know, he gave me, when I finished my first film and I was broke, a young filmmaker, um, and I couldn't afford an office space. He gave my, he gave me a free, free office space in his building that Rick was just talking about. That's his beautiful building off of, you know, uh, Gloucester Lane. And uh, wow. it's, uh, you know, he was a very, very generous, um, you know, mischievous, smart, you know, savvy uh, yeah. filmmaker. I want to come back uh, to that idea of this progressive uh, man from the beaches and how he becomes this voice of uh, becoming liberal in Hollywood. But first, I actually want to play you guys a, a clip from In the Heat of the Night just to get a deep sense of the social justice that runs through Norman Jewison's work. Let's play it. Some people, well, let us say the people who work for Mr. Colbert might reasonably regard you as the person least likely to mourn his passing. We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say, last night about midnight? Good, Lesby. Yeah. You saw it. Well, I saw it. Well, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. That's from 1967. That is Norman Jewison's In the Heat of the Night, starring the great Sidney Poitier. Listen, this was one of the first Hollywood films to really grapple with matters of race. And then Norman came back to that theme, as you mentioned, Clement, with movies like A Soldier's Story or Hurricane. Clement, many years ago, you introduced a screening of In the Heat of the Night in Toronto. Did you get a chance to talk to Norman about that movie? Well, absolutely. I, I, I spoke about it. I spoke with him about it all the time, you know, mm. and you just uh, played the, uh, you know, scene with uh, Sidney Poitier, one of my fondest memories. I made a film for the CBC called called The Planet of Virginia Brown, and I showed it to Norman, and um, and uh, one of my sort of pleasures was to sit in the theater with Norman Jewison, Sidney Poitier, and myself watching a film that I made. Wow. You know, and it was such a, that memory is in my mind forever. And, um, you know, he, you know, he was... Um, you know, I knew Norman from his films, you know, as, as a young person growing up. And I think every young black person, I'm sure just young people around the world, that famous line from 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 In the Heat of the Night, they call me Mr. Tibbs. It was such like a a powerful, you know, cinematic moment that yeah. still resonates. And, and of course, as a young person who who didn't know who Norman Jewison was, it was really affirming to see someone like, Sidney Poitier, who was from the Caribbean, like I, I was, in this film, saying, you know, um, you know, speaking about his own humanity in such a forceful way, it was very, very inspiring. Uh, Clement, I have to admit, I have like some chills of the notion of you sitting in a movie theater <laughs> next to Sidney and next to Norman, watching a movie that you made. That must have been quite an experience for you. It was. It was a. It was a tremendous experience, and um, you know, and just those moments of sharing and quiet moments just sort of hanging out with them, you know, um, whenever I would go to, I remember once, you know, early in my career, uh, I was at the airport and I was, uh, and Norman just happened to be there. We sort of sat beside each other. We talked for a while. And then, um, you know, I was in coach and Norman was in business. And then um, as I was walking up to the, to, to board the plane, they, they, they call my name. Mm -hmm. And, and then they said, you know, your change, your seat was changed. And Norman had arranged for me to sit in business class. Hmm. 
which was, you know, that's what tells you everything about him. And, I'm, mm-hmm. I, you know, th- those kinds of things and just little things like, you know, when I went to New York for the first time and I had, you know, I was broke, I had no money and Norman had an apartment there. And uh, he said, you know, you, you can stay at my apartment for the weekend. You know, that's mm-hmm. uh, that's the kind of person he was, a real, true progressive, you know, in, um, you know, and uh, a real, a real wonderful human being. And, um, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, Barry, I want to talk about that, that white kid who is progressive from the beaches. Can you give us a sense of how this person becomes the the voice of progressive Hollywood? How how that transformation happens? I think it was, you know, it was, those were kind of values that were instilled in him at a very young age yeah. uh, through his very working class family. You know, his father owned a dry goods store and the beaches, and then he would spend his afternoons whiling away time at the local theater, just kind of uh, mainlining movies because you could just, you know, pop in a few a few uh, coins there and spend the whole weekend uh, immersed in the big screen but so i think it was that kind of home life and that kind of innate love of entertaining and entertainment mm. and storytelling and that kind of just coalesced into something and you know he had a passion for helming things he had a passion for i think managing and stagecraft and the whole technical aspect of it which is kind of an under uh, spoken talking point when talking about norman because as much as he was like great on social justice um you know he was great working with actors um he was great working across genre but he was a craftsman above all else like he Mm. wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to do all that if he didn't know exactly what he was doing Mm. but back to your actual question (laughs) so you know this kid who has these like great you know kind of very progressive uh values instilled in him at a young life then he goes into the hollywood system Mm. and he sees kind of an opportunity um and he sees kind of you know what america is and i think he always felt a little bit out of place there and there was a moment certainly in the 60s after you know a spate of horrible assassinations where he moved his family and uprooted them back and took him to london because he was just he couldn't handle the political climate there but that just kind of speaks to how he was a guy who was able to smuggle in, in a way, these hmm. very progressive, uh, if we can even, you know, go so far as to put them as quote unquote Canadian kind of lower class L liberal values into the Hollywood system. And he was able to do that because he knew how to make very slick, very precise, very sincere entertainment. Well, what's wild to me, Rick, is that a lot of directors work in a genre. They work in a specific kind of voice. And Norman didn't do that. He had this incredibly vast filmography, right? The romantic comedies, musicals, period dramas, mm-hmm. even a little sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at his vast sort of filmography, what movie stands out for you as like the quintessential Norman Jewison movie? I think you could answer that question about almost any director. <laughs> what is the quint except for Norman Jewison? Because I cannot tell you how important the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, is as a satire, as a comedy. It is it is an almost perfect satire. Mm. And In the Heat of the Night is an incredible drama. And, you know, doing musical theater on film, the musical is one of the hardest things to do in the world. Yes. And perhaps the best musical is Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. These are all made by the same man. It actually doesn't make sense at all. It defies <laughs> logic. And it's in it's in it's an incredible uh, legacy. You know, nothing could nothing could have stopped Norman. Like Norman, he started out in television, but he started out when television was starting out, and he wanted to be in the movies, but he knew that was impossible. So he wanted to be in television, and he went to the CBC. What passed as the CBC at the time, they were only wrapping their head around this thing, television. So he got on a freighter. He got on a freighter and crossed the Atlantic and went to London where he didn't know anyone and walked through the doors of the BBC, found this Canadian guy who was hosting, presenting a show and said, I'm from Canada. I want to make television. And the guy gave him a job as his stand in. And he said, you stand there (laughs) during rehearsals and you watch what everyone does and you learn how to do it. And that's what Norma did. Then he returned back to the CBC and uh, the rest is history. And he very quickly was in New York working with some of the biggest names in show business in this new new form of television. And um, nothing could have stopped this guy. It's amazing. And, And his early films very much looked like his TV work. And then he turns into this incredible filmmaker. It's amazing. 
I'm glad that the CBC factoid came up because when CBC television launched, Norman was there day one as, you know, one of the assistant directors in this place, which is quite an incredible legacy if you think about it. Uh, Barry, you're especially fond of this movie. This is your place. That's right. So this is where we were going. Yeah. You know, we had a deal. You told me if I came with you to the opera, then, then you'd leave me alone forever. And I came with you. Now, I'm going to marry your brother, and you're going to leave me alone forever, right? A person can, can see where they've messed up in their life, and they can change the way they do things, and they could even change their luck. So maybe, maybe my nature does draw me to you. That don't mean I have to go with it. I can take hold of myself, and I can say yes to some things and no to other things that are going to ruin everything. I can do that. Otherwise, you know what? What good is this stupid life that God gave us? I mean, for what? Are you listening to me? Yeah. What a performance. From 1987, that is one of Norman Jewison's most beloved movies, starring Cher. But as much as you love that movie, love Moonstruck, you've said that, you know, you, if you've had to, it's really hard for you to pick just one, you know, Norman Jewison film or name this one his crowning achievement. Why is that, do you think? Just because, you know, trying to do a unified cinematic theory of Norman Jewison is an impossible thing. He was so adept at working in every kind of genre and kind of, you know, wringing out the best that that genre had to offer. Hmm. So what's peak Jewison? Uh, well, there's a peak musical Jewison, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, or, you know, maybe for the Gentiles, Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, peak heist uh, Jewison, Thomas Crown Fair. There's peak rom-com Jewison, which is Moonstruck, and which really is kind of like like, you know, the core of what rom-com has evolved into uh, throughout the 80s, 90s, and early aughts. Um, and we're only kind of now just getting that back. Um, and, uh, you know, what's peak uh, legal thriller, Norman Jewison, and Injustice for All? Um, there's just so many. Um, and and uh, no other working director, really, um, can boast such not only a prolific uh, career, 24 films, over 50 years that's mm -hmm. quite a, you know that's quite an average i don't think you'd find anybody working quite as hard maybe except for the real spielberg or, or somebody like that um but not only that but just working in such disparate um you know themes and voices and forms mm -hmm. um it takes a real confidence uh to be able to do that and to come out the other side so beloved um so influential so iconic. I love that both you and Rick um, are a little overwhelmed at the prospect of picking a, hey, here is a Norman Jewison movie that is definitive. Clement, are you up for the task or is this something you're like, no, actually, it's, it really is that difficult to pick, you know, maybe a starting point for people to start from? Well, you know, it's um, the first time I'm actually, the first time I actually met uh, Norman Jewison was uh, when he showed a film called called The Soldier's Story. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just happened to be at a program where um, Charles Fuller, who who wrote The Soldier's Play originally, and that Norman adapted. And, um, and you know, whenever I think of the moment of, for, for me and, 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 and a Norman film is, is, is a soldier's story, because mm. it sort of encapsulates a lot of what he does so well. You know, in that film, you had a young Denzel Washington is, is in that film. The film is a is is a really striking, um, intricate and mystery, um, and it's you know, and just it's about all the things that he cares about, you know, social social justice. So, I mean, it's it's hard to pick one, but just as you know, from a personal standpoint and from yeah. a you know a memory, it's 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 a social story. Uh, if folks are just joining us, my name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud, and this show is called Commotion. And today we're remembering the great Canadian filmmaker Norman Jewison, who passed away on Saturday at, at the age of 97. I'm speaking with Clement Fergo, Rick Mercer, and Barry Hertz. Uh, guys, I want to play you a clip. I want to play you a clip from Norman's speech at the Oscars in 1999. This is when he's accepting the Irvin G. Thalberg Memorial Award. And my parting thought to all those young filmmakers is this. Just find some good stories. 
Never mind the gross, the top 10, bottom 10, what's the rating, what's the demographics. Just, you know something, the biggest grossing picture is not necessarily the best picture. I want to tell you something. So just tell stories that move us to laughter and tears and perhaps reveal a little truth about ourselves. As you can hear in that speech, Norman was a big mentor to young filmmakers. Here in Toronto, he founded the Canadian Film Centre, which is a, an organization that has helped so, jumpstart the careers of so many up-and-coming f- Canadian filmmakers. Clement, can you just talk a little bit about why the CFC was so important to him? Um, you know, when uh, Norman Jewison came back, you know, he, he wanted to contribute, you know, he wanted to find um, a, a school that was kind of like the AFI in in the uh, U.S. and hmm. and um, and he decided to to create this this uh, film center, um, and you know, out of that film center, there's a whole generation g- generations now of filmmakers. Um, you know, I still have, have, have very much a part of the the film the the the, the film center's legacy I'm on its board. Um, you know, of of uh, it's been instrumental in my career without a doubt. You know, I made my mm. first short films there. I made my first feature films there. Um, and, you know, uh, that's where I was, uh, you know, I was sort of trained to, to, to be a, to be a, a director and you, mm. you know, just listen to Norman giving advice to filmmakers. You know, I remember I would ask him from time to time for advice. And, uh, one of the things he would, he would say to me, you know, he said, you know, I was, I was about to shoot a film and I, I was nervous about my, my first day. And he said, you know, Clement, you know, what you do on your first day, pick a shot, something that's real simple like a car driving up and, a, and, a, and an actor getting out of the car, pick that shot and just do one take of it. Hmm. So that the whole crew and the whole cast knows that, you know, we mean business, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so every film I do, I, even to this day, you know, whenever I start a, a show or TV show hmm. or a film, one of the, one of the things I do on my very first day is I pick a shot and I just do one take. Mm-hmm. So that everyone is suddenly in tune with with uh, what we're doing, and um, you know, I, I took you know I took those little advice from Norman, and also too, you know, he he would say things just make films that are personal to you, you know, yeah. um, make films that are, are, are from the heart. You know, I, w- I would show him something and be like, "Why do you want to do this? What's in it? What's what's a part of this project that's in it for you? You know, right. why you know do you see yourself in it?" So. Um, I take that as a, as a gift to always try to do work that is extremely uh, personal in some ways. Barry, it's it's not lost on me that the Oscar nominations came out this morning and the film Past yeah. Lives by Canadian filmmaker uh, Celine Song received a Best Picture uh, nomination. That's a really big deal. It feels like in some ways we're living in a world that Norman Jewison envisioned for young Canadian filmmakers. You had a chance to interview Norman a, a few uh, on a few occasions about the CFC. What do you think inspired his dedication to that place when he could have very easily could have been like, I'm just going to live in Malibu and like not really come back to the cold? No, I mean, yeah, if I had that kind of uh, Hollywood money, you would never see me again. Um, (laughs) But I think what really inspired him was he didn't grow up with that kind of support system. There Mm. was no support system. There was no system. I mean, you know, he joined the CBC, as we said, when television was in its infancy. Um, So for him to watch, you know, from his perch in Hollywood as, you know, Canadian filmmakers would would struggle and, and uh, you know, work up against a system that was totally built uh, against their interests, he decided to make some, you know, actual changes um, yeah. and to actually give those opportunities that, you know, he himself did not have. Uh, and that was a pretty remarkable thing. I mean, you know, 2000 plus graduates have gone through that uh, center over yeah. since its inception in the late 80s and the number of projects that have been spawned by that uh, directly indirectly is incalculable um so i think it it's not hyperbole to say that the canadian screen sector would not be what it is today without the cfc which means without norman jewison i have so many more questions but unfortunately we have to leave it there yeah, i was hoping we could get to the part where norman saved the santa claus parade Wait, <laughs> do you do you want to tell the story? He did. He saved, and it's part of the. You know, you were talking about the film center. I mean, it's because he was a guy who believed in giving back, but not just to the film world. Like he was watching the news, and he heard the Santa Claus parade was going to stop. And he the the Toronto Cohen. Santa Claus parade. 
the Toronto Santa Claus Parade. And he called jo- George Cohan, famous yeah. Canadian business person. And he said, well, we, we can't allow this to happen. And they saved the Santa Claus Parade. <laughs> what? And, yeah. How did they, well, yeah. do, do you know, do you know well, how they did the it? Things, one of the things they did was they invented uh, something called the celebrity clowns. And the celebrity clowns, <laughs> they convinced business people uh, to spend vast amounts of money for the privilege of walking in the Santa Claus parade or business people would pay vast amounts for their friends to walk in the Santa Claus parade. And it was called celebrity clowns, but they weren't celebrities because they were completely covered in makeup with red noses <laughs> and they marched at the front and everyone marching at the front of that parade was p- spending thousands and thousands of dollars to be able to do it. And uh, they saved the parade. It almost went away. That is an this incredible is, this story. This is like a heritage. This is a heritage minute that needs to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Thank you for sharing that story because those are. I mean, this is the thing about you know someone with a legacy like Norman Jewison is like there is the ten, there's a temptation to only talk about the films, and then as a result, all of this sort of stuff gets lost, and it's and there are so many of these stories that keep coming out. It's a beautiful story. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you to all of you for being here. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Rick Mercer is a longtime friend of Norman Jewison. He's also a writer and comedian. His latest book is The Road Years, a memoir continued. Clement Virgo is a filmmaker. Go watch his film brother. And, Mary, and Barry Hertz is a Globe, Globe and Mail's arts and film editor. Norman Jewison died on Saturday. He was 97 years old. There's a lot more to the story. You can go to cbcnews.ca. And that is it for the podcast today. Remember, you can listen to any episode of Commotion anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on Instagram, by the way. We are at CommotionCBC. My name is Alameen Abdul-Mahmoud. I'm going to be here tomorrow. I'll see you then.